for you guys to open your arms to us and say, hey, I accept your version too, and I really love it, and you gave me extra, that's a big freaking deal. Are we, are we, what are we doing here? There's a massive screen, and I just realized. Yeah, I shouldn't have sat next to Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> It gives me great pleasure to bring a special guest, somebody who was unannounced. So they have done literally hundreds of IMDb credits. They have done TV, film, games, commercials. They are a producer and director of their own company, Performance Capture Productions. But most importantly, they have voiced multiple, multiple Resident Evil characters over multiple Resident Evil games. Gives me great pleasure to introduce the one and only and the previously unannounced Neil Newborn. One more time, give it up. I'm blind. Pleasure, yeah. I was seated anywhere. Hey, you know what? Since since nobody else is here, you get you get to sit near your ne your new your, your new best friend. Hey, you snooze, you lose. <laughs> what? It's like you've never worked with a microphone. <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? <laughs> I'm kidding. Nah. Yeah, there you are. You're late. I had to buy time. We have more people. This is incredible. They showed up to my party. I am cool. How's it going? All right. All right, so we'll do a quick introduction while they do their quick introductions. We have with us today, we have the voice of Claire Redfield again. This is Stephanie Panicello. We have Lady Dimitris herself and winner of multiple industry awards. We are pleased to introduce the one and only Maggie Robertson. star of theater, film, voice work, video games. We have the voice of the uh, uh, the alleged, what's this, master of unlocking. We have Jill Valentine's voice. We have Nicole Tompkins. <laughs> and last but especially not least, we have the Emmy-nominated gentleman from over 100 commercials who has also voiced work in uh, Dead Space, Life is Strange, Madden NFL, and also is the voice of Leon Kennedy in Resident Evil, the one and only Nick Apostolidis. Yeah. yeah, you said it right. I said it right. Yeah. I said it right. Extra points. Nailed it. Totally. How's everybody doing? Everybody's mics are on? Uh, yeah. Hi. Awesome. Maggie, you here? What? <laughs> That's a no. There we go. Were you talking to me? We were talking. What was the know. question? I, I have a question. I think the audience would know. What were you doing? I had to come in. I literally had to come in and gate crash your panel huh. because you. Why are you looking only at me when I you say this? We were all late. <laughs> we are so happy to have all of you. This is incredible. So right off the bat, so we have to ask. This is your very first uh, too many games, correct? Yeah. Never yeah. been here before. This is awesome, guys. One more time, big warm welcome to our guests here for Resident Evil. I'm a huge fan of the comfy gaming chairs for a panel. Like, no one. No, yeah. can I show you the really coolest no. We can, can show you just the coolest trick? Like, hey. I was thinking that too. I was like, why are we sitting up? Right Usually now? we get those metal chairs so we don't nod off. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I, I have to show you the coolest thing ever, though. Watch this. <gasps> oh, wait. It removes. It's magnetic, right? <laughs> it's magnetic. I mean, Resident Evil is neat, but like, oh, magnetic. God. Comfort level just went right? up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> Magnets. Magnets. Nice. So let's uh, let's start things off. Let's just go right down the line here. Uh, whoever would like to go, we can just go do a, do a quick intro Aww. of yourself. Tell us a little bit about you, your accomplishments, and and why you love past the controller. <laughs> why we love what? <laughs> My dumb podcast. <laughs> Sorry. Pass the controller. Oh, yeah, great. 
I'm ready. She was paying attention. She's like, I'm not signing on for anything. She's like... <laughs> Neil? What? You've already introduced yourself, huh? Not at all. I was all your accomplishments, here, please. It's going to be uh, a while. Everyone sit down. Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Neil Newborn. I'm an actor, director, producer. I've been working in community games for about 15 years, doing full performance capture, stunts, combat, and all the rest of it. I've been unlucky enough to have done six projects with this one over here, uh, but I've been very lucky enough to have been worked in franchises like Resident Evil, Baldur's Gate 3, uh, Plow oh. the Apes, uh, Detroit Become Human, and... He also forgot to mention multi-award winning BAFTA multi nominated actor Neil Nubon. Thank you very much, yeah. I was also lucky enough to be doing that. And I'm privileged enough to be asked here as well with my family, which is really cool. Thank you. Nice. Hi, I'm uh, Nicole Tompkins, and uh, I endorse Pass the Mic. <laughs> no, <laughs> please don't endorse us. We're not What's worthy it? of that. What's We're it? horrible. What's it? This lovely person's podcast should check it out. Um, I'm an actor, and it is an absolute privilege to be here as well. I echo what he says, and it's so lovely to see so many wonderful Resident Evil fans. Can we all agree it is one of the best communities ever? Um, yeah, and I'm here with some of my favorite people, and I also work in film and TV and, and video games and PCAP and the whole joy, and I've done a lot of... A lot of work with this one and these humans over here and can't wait to get to Maggie because she's one of my favorite people in the in the whole planet and she's being incredibly distracting. But first, can you please meet my personal favorite female character from the Resident Evil franchise? Stephanie Panicello as Claire Redfield! Yeah. Why, thank you. <laughs> um, hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Panicello. Uh, for those of you guys that are Spanish speakers, I'm Stephanie Panicello. Um, I feel like that's necessary because these days I also voice another character in a different scary franchise in Texas Chainsaw Massacre as Maria Flores. Woo! So, um, but uh, yeah, so you guys might know me as Claire Redfield in the Resident Evil 2 franchise these days because uh, I'm, yeah, so I got to work uh, so with Nick over here on Resident Evil 2 Remake. Uh, also, we came back again uh, with Resident Evil Infinite Darkness, um, and then with my girl here for Resident Evil Death Island. Um, and then if any of you guys are Genshin fans as well, you guys might know me as Shen Yun or Cloud Retainer. One is most impressed. Um, or, I don't even know, there's a million things. Uh, Marvel's What If, a bunch of other things. So. A lot of voiceover, motion capture, all of the good stuff. And, uh, which by the way, a bunch of us also uh, stream as well. So you guys may even know us from there. So uh, happy to be here and so, so, so in love with our community. We are so blessed and you guys have been incredibly welcoming since day one. So thank you so much for accepting all of us people, especially all you OG fans that were probably concerned about it at first. Thank you for accepting us here. Um, what is the chaos that is happening here? <laughs> The, we're we're it's having some trouble. Maggie Robertson, just, the chaos you, happening here. You've discovered Maggie. levers on your seat, now you can't get it back. Levers, <laughs> levers. Hey everyone, levers. <laughs> it's like I'm a, Maggie Robertson. It's like a dentist That's office a over there. It's fine. Yes, it's a I lever. To, we invented. It comes from Latin. It's a it's lever. It's a lever. It's a lever. I would call it a lever. I know Excuse you would, me, it's my turn to speak. Oh, yeah, I'm so sorry. Did you want that attention, leave, Maggie? Leave her. Did you want the attention next? It's a lever. Um, anyway, so firstly, I've discovered that these armrests are also magnetic, and that's <laughs> super cool. No. So, I, at first I thought I broke it. <laughs> Very pleased to find out that it is, in fact, magnetic. Um, all right, I'll be a respectful human now. Just what, was, what are we doing here? I'm Maggie Robertson. <laughs> Hi, thank you to whoever started that. Um... I've done things like Resident Evil. Baldur's Gate 3. Village. Baldur's Gate 3. There you go. I'm Orin the Red in Baldur's Gate 3, for those who don't know. And my joke that I make now um, is that I played a vampiric character first, and then Neil's just copying me. Oh. <laughs> I think I said it before, darling. Sometimes you need to improve upon perfection. <laughs> Mike we'll be drop. having a words. Words will be had. Um, yeah, I do a lot of video games. That's me. Well, what else are, what are we supposed to do? Endorse his podcast. Yeah, you need to endorse his podcast. Oh, no, no. Was, oh. Guys, that clearly was it. What's was, the podcast? That was, <laughs> <laughs> that was probably. 
probably when I thought I was breaking the chair. So uh, what's the podcast name? <laughs> our, our podcast is Pass the Controller. Yay. Controller. Hey, everyone. Controller. Yes, thank everyone, you. Yes, listen that's up to so, uh, Pass the Controller. What's your name? My name is uh, Brian Civic Minded Lessig. I like my, how you had to. My friend. <laughs> Amp up. I, don't, I don't. I don't get asked by uh, Lady D many questions, uh, so I get a little flustered. Sorry, but yes, uh, my name is Brian. Uh, you can call me Civic Minded. My co-host right there is the Smoke, and we have a couple other members throughout Hi. the crowd there. Whoa. We don't mention them until tomorrow. Anyway, hello. Obviously, you can tell we, we kind of hijack uh, most. I love it. In most situation. Well, I hijacked this whole thing because I'm not even supposed to be doing this. You're I killing just it. I saw that there You're was a mic to be on this. Weird working Perfect. today, man. This is me trying to get voice work. I thought figured you would know some people. You know what I'm saying? All right. Hey, Nick, so. who are you? Last but not least. <laughs> it's been so long. At me, but it's been so long. I forget escape. the question. What? Tell him about yourself. Fuck. Jesus sake, uh, listen. Ma Maggie is also a musician and she's gonna be featured on my new rap album coming out. Uh, I don't know why she's laughing because we've talked about this. You wanna give them a little sample? Dad joke coming. Nikki dead hands? No, I don't wanna spoil anything. Uh, Nikki no knuckles? I don't, I don't wanna spoil it, but. I'm, uh, Ice cream may or may not be involved. Yes. Ooh. Maybe, anyways, uh, my name is Nick Apostolidis. Um, uh, I do a lot of creative type things, but you probably know me from this franchise here as Leon Kennedy and RE2 and RE4 and also Infinite Darkness. Uh, so I'm just here to, to be with my family up on stage here and hang out with you guys. Are we having a good time? <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so much. That was awesome. Now we know a little bit more about you. I have a bunch of... Back to you, Brian. I, <laughs> I know. I just, <laughs> this is your only time to speak, and then it'll be another 20 minutes. Know, right it'll now. become madness again. Enjoy yeah. it, man. You are be, so blushing right now, be, man. Before you all came up on stage, uh, we were kind of vamping in the crowd here a little bit, and one of the things I had said is a reference to the original Resident Evil game, which everybody remembers as a great game, right? But one of the things that everybody kind of stands out to, in their memory is some of the voice acting was, you know, for its time, since it was a new thing in video games, some of it was a little rough, you know, Jill, Master of Unlocking, I hope that this is not Chris's blood, stuff like that. So, you know, the deliveries were just maybe not up to what we've come to understand and love over the course of the past 25 years. So here's my question. So when you look back over sort of like the trajectory of this franchise, is there a sense, how do you feel about how you've helped to mold what the game has become? Because honestly, each and every one of you does a fantastic job, really brings the characters to life. What sense of pride do you have in that? What sense of ownership? Um, yeah, I, I think, especially because many of us have stepped into roles that were iconic before we ever had the opportunity to touch them, uh, there's such a legacy uh, of this entire franchise, and it is so special to meet the fans that have been fans since the 90s and come up and are like, wow, I really, really love your version of this character. Um, and I won't speak for... for my other peeps, but I, I feel like we all definitely have a deep respect for sort of what came before, uh, even though it was very different and sometimes cheesy or a different energy and genre, we got to step into these roles in a rather kind of cinematic version and cinematic take. So we had creatives that were also incredibly passionate about the franchise, guiding and kind of giving us the, the guidelines of like, hey, I'm gonna bring my flavor and I'm also gonna be in the genre of this style. And when people come up and go, well, I really like the original, I say, and you still have it. And I'm so glad, because so do I. Um, and it was such an honor to get to kind of like play around in this grittier, but it, there's still so much humor and heart, I think. It just is pervasive throughout the series. Good job, yeah. Nikki. Thanks, yeah. It's, it's absolutely true. Like, I feel like, you know, you can't really compare two different types if you're doing remake to original. Like, there's a reason why we were able to do it, and it's because of the originals. You know, there's a reason why it's because of that. So I think sometimes people put this, like, hard and fast, like, oh, well, the, the remake is so much better than, than the other. But, like, you have to think about the confines of where it started. There wasn't even room for enough VO in there. Like, there's only so much room in, like, whatever, depending on what you were using it on, whether it be your 
like CD for PlayStation or like your little cartridge thing. Like there was no space for it. So the fact that they were able to storytell in such a still dramatic and terrifying way, you know, in the, what was it, 16 bit or whatever it was at the time, you know what I mean? Like that was still terrifying. We still imagined it. We still felt it. We still envisioned all of it. And so, um, I think being able to take the, something that was so iconic that we, uh, some of us, which Nick for sure definitely grew up on hardcore, like, it's, it's, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to play some iconic characters, you know? And to be able to have given that free reign to make it our own is beautiful. And for you guys to open your arms to us and say, hey, I accept your version too, and I really love it, and you gave me extra, that's a big freaking deal. Are we, are we, what are we doing here? There's a massive screen, and I just realized. Yeah, I shouldn't have sat next to Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> Well said, Stephanie. <laughs> Some of us were listening. I hope you guys were listening. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so you, Stephanie, you, you touched on something, I, and I, I want to kind of parlay this into a bigger, broader question. So when you're doing any kind of voice work, to me, it seems at least like to do voice work for something that is horror based seems almost intrinsically more difficult than like anything else because it would be so simple and easy to come off as like, you know, throwing too much behind it or making it sound corny. How do you genuinely work to help convey that sense of terror through nothing more than just your voice? Well, can I add something to that? Absolutely. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Because it wasn't just voice for us. What? The, the, the physical part, the, too. We're getting the, to that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah but that's, that's also part of that question, though. Yeah, okay. So that's the thing about, like... Because you did a full performance as well, right? Yeah. yeah. So all of, us, all of us did full performance on mm -hmm. each of the franchises we were involved with, which also helps with the, as, as an ensemble, because you're not isolated in a booth. You're living it in the present moment as a group in the actual volume, which does change things dramatically, I think. So this is a question for Stephanie, I just wanted to add that. No, I feel like it's a great question for you though, because you direct as well, so yeah. you have a lot of opinions on multi-genre mm, sure. as well, which really, I think is, is part of it. Right. Like, yeah. the, horror, the horror element of, yeah. of bringing a story yeah. to life, so. I think it's important that if you're gonna build an atmosphere like that, that you can create a play right space on. that actually yeah. can really help the actors by giving this atmosphere between yeah, the different absolutely. actors of all that, what you're doing in the scene. Like, we, I, I was multiple zombies for this one over here. Um, and, you know, we did the family scene all together with all of the actors for Resident Evil Village, for instance. And having that collective playtime in a volume physically, I think is a big difference from what they used to do back in the day right. when it was just voice work. That would have been harder for them, I think, to have conveyed that kind of story. Where for us, I think it was easier because we had each other to play with. Uh, as, as actors in the volume, and we can create that sense of horror together with a lot of fun. Whereas in, when you're doing booth work, you're usually alone. So to do that kind of work is a lot more challenging, I think. And that takes a steady hand from a director, but also takes a really good, solid idea and a good actor to be able to fulfill that. So sorry about going. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I was gonna get to the mocap yeah. part because I think it's interesting that there's still that physical aspect of it where you know that you have to be so much in tune with your character, move how they move, talk how they talk, react how they react. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had uh, a very similar uh, panel with the cast of Red Dead Redemption 2, oh, which was really awesome. Great, exactly. Right, right. And it was one of those things where you really saw that chemistry come out even more because they were really in the scenes together. So with something, again, sort of to circle back, because I, I guess what I'm looking for is when you have such great chemistry together and you clearly have a bond, dare I say even a friendship, Except for one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> is it? Does that make? Nobody it, likes we, don't, that. we don't like these people. <laughs> does, we love does, her. does that make you? Does that make it easier to get into a scene, or does that look a little bit harder? Because the, oh, easier, <laughs> easier. Because okay. because you start trusting friends. Um, I think that trust means you can play more as well. So yeah, I mean, you yeah. guys obviously you have a friendship and also sure. working relationship, and what especially from so I directed this one in a game called Deliver Us Mars. And Nicole and I can speak very directly with each other if there's like an issue that we need to work through without worrying, am I going to upset this person or is there an ego involved? It's just like, okay, what's the problem? Okay, let's work the what solution. What do we need? Okay, What do we great. need? Okay, let's try right. that. Da, da, da. So I think to work with friends is always the ideal um, because you get that trust element mm -hmm. very easily. Whereas if you're working with strangers, you can still have the trust element, but it's a big leap of faith. 
Sure. I think so. Yeah. Sure. I think a lot of people here became friends really oh, yeah. fast. Some of us haven't even worked with one another. Yes. I have not worked with everybody. Yeah. I've worked with two, but I haven't worked with you two. But and it doesn't still, feel that way, does it? It doesn't feel that way at all. Yeah. At all. I feel like the day that we go and we all hopefully work together one day, <laughs> like it would just be easy. Yeah. It would just be easy. So going, going right down the line, just a question for each of you. What is your favorite thing about what it is that you do? <laughs> uh, t telling stories. Um, I mean, as a gamer, I I'm, I'm 40, but I've been playing games for 35 years. Started with Atari back in the day. Any Atari people? Come on now, show your age. <laughs> yes, okay then. Uh, and so now to just be able to be a part of the collaboration effort and to create my favorite hobby with these developers. My, Capcom's have been my favorite developer since uh, Mega Man days. And so, you know, to work with them is a dream come true. And now, you know, the fact that they care about my input, that means everything to me, you know? So that's, that's what I like most is that I can create, help create the memories of like my childhood. You know what I mean? For, for new generations and old, you know? Nice, thank you. Oh God, um, I love performance capture specifically because it is so reliant upon imagination in order to make it feel real. And for me, what that does is it takes you back to the root of, I think, why we all wanted to be actors anyway, which is the sense of play. And you get to have kind of that childlike sense of wonder yeah. when you go into the volume and there's nothing that... <laughs> Don't interrupt me. Add that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's nothing there to help you tell the story except you, yourself, and you. Uh, <laughs> so, no props, no... Hi. I just wanted to make sure Hi, you me. moved your mic so that your tattoo was showing off while you... Because right now you're, um, the mic's like in front of it, and I require... Just hold on. I'm just gonna... <laughs> keep, stop, keep talking. There, there you go. go. Ah, there that's go perfect. On. Everyone, I have a tattoo. It's my very first tattoo that I ever got. I woke up on a Monday and I said, Nicole, would you like to permanently etch something onto my body? And she said, yes, and here it is. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, the plot thickens. Wait, it you does. did the tattoo? I sure Correct. did. Nicole is oh, a burgeoning okay. tattoo artist. <laughs> that is Everyone, awesome. Thank you. Reach out to her for some tattoos. I have to point out the only thing she tattooed before Maggie was rabbits. No, and Colleen. I tattooed Colleen oh, that's and right. Maggie. You had a One yeah. human before me. That's <laughs> it. Yeah, there's nice. a lot of faith. Anyway, I'm so sorry. Keep going. I just really was. I really wanted to see it. Like, no, now I'm done. Okay, I have great. nothing more to <laughs> say. She's done. That's it. Steph, what's your favorite thing about what we do? Yeah. Oh wow, sincerity. There's, yeah, there's Here a lot. Comes. There's a lot. Um, I've. This is gonna get really deep, <laughs> but that's just who I am anyway. So um, I think I've what's learned. Great. I don't have a tattoo, uh, but I think I, I learned. I can fix that. <laughs> Maybe one day, Nicole, after your hundredth tattoo. <laughs> um, no, uh, line up, guys. Yeah. We're gonna get to ninety-nine, and then I'm gonna do stuff today. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I realized that one of the things I really love, aside from community that we build, and you know, being able to play and being able, like to storytell, is Acting is really cathartic. Um, it's gonna sound weird, but like, acting is creativity, right? It's the most human form of storytelling that we could possibly tell. We're putting ourselves in somebody else's shoes and we are authentically telling you guys something either wonderful that's happened, something terrible that's happened, something, like there's just so much and it is incredibly cathartic, and I hadn't really realized it. Um, like, I knew it was a thing, but I hadn't really realized it. But I've been doing this since I was a child. You know, I was imagining things to help me get through something as, since I was a little kid, you know? And now I just get to do it as an adult, and I get to express it, and I, I get to really fully go through these emotions and these feelings and these stories, and then we all get to experience it and it just connects us right back and in a weird way it becomes a healing for everybody. I know that sounds weird, but like we connect with these storylines in ways that maybe it's not the identical story, but it's a similar feeling. 
And so I think I just really love that because I hadn't even realized it was just the human experience of it all that I really love. So I love that. Uh, I'll echo that all day long. Um, I think I'll extend on that a little bit of, you know, something he's already touched on. Um, the people make all the difference, and I think one of my favorite things is getting to work with people that inspire me. So watching someone else throw down and being like, oh, I need to show up and rise to the occasion is one of my favorite things in the world. So when you get to work with another creative and be like, dang, heard, yes, sir. You know, like that kind of energy and getting to play off of each other is something that really excites me. Um, and then genuinely, the people's stories that come and like the number of people that come up and will tell me their story or what a character meant to them. Um, Maggie said this before and I love stealing it all the time, <sighs> which is that once we've done the roles and gone through the storytelling process and the and art, the art. Um, uh, once we've done that, really oh, the, in role unison, in unison, isn't, guys. the role isn't really yours anymore. Instead, we get to give it to you and so once we've done our job, like, it's now yours. It's out there in the open. And the way that you interpret and bring it back and tell those stories. Oh, um, I'm still going. <laughs> it's done. Oh, okay. It's done. But know that I said that first. <laughs> so the way that you take on those roles and then bring it back to us and go, this was so meaningful, or I found this. Like, I learn things about these characters from fans all the time. And I go, wow, I didn't even, like, oh, wow, you're deepening my understanding um, in magical ways. Okay. <laughs> wow. I like that little, like, you know, improv. That was, that was really cool. <laughs> We're professionals. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Highly Very cool. trained. <laughs> Neil? No, I actually ask another question because I have a scoot after this. I'm apparently I'm being asked to go. Bye. I'm not supposed to be here. I'll tell you what, one last question before you have to skedaddle. Yeah, yeah. Because you guys brought it up. I was not going to bring this up, but there's this little rumor going around. Maybe some of you in the audience have heard about a particular remake, possibly a Resident Evil 1 remake. Don't look at me like that. You know, they know. Don't they? Do you not know? Um, do you understand oh. how our line of work works? We know you nothing. You need to call your agents nothing like as ever, soon as you get off ever, the stage. Ever, 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 ever. And the when last we know people. something, we still know nothing. Ever, ever, so ever. We never ever. know anything. <laughs> We're just the actors. Word, the word on the street right now is that they are going to go back and remake the original Resident Evil game. That would be cool. So hopefully, God willing, we see you all as part of it. I think that would be really awesome. Uh, anyway, do you have to go? Can you stick yeah, around? I'm being on drag back. So I can do one more question. I understand. I can do one sure. more question. Okay, go. one more question. Okay. Oh yeah. my God, oh my God, pressure's on. Um, so, okay, you know, how about this? You know, you own your own company and you do yeah. this now uh, on a more professional level from the, from the top. So, when you work with uh, budding voice actors, with, with people that do their vo uh, motion capture, things like this, what kind of advice do you give them? What kind of tutelage and direction do you think is best for them to receive? Oh, that's a great tutelage. question. Tutelage? Yeah. Um, so, we've got any actors here, by the way. Yeah, can you put your hand straight up? Hello, actors. You've made a terrible choice. <laughs> but if you need to do it, keep Neil doing Newborn, it. Neil Newborn, everybody. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm joking, I'm joking. Uh, I'm joking, I'm joking. So the bottom line for my, the work that we do, I mean, I do film and television as well, but I also used to do theater. Now I do mainly performance capture. If you are studying, or even if you finish, finish your studies, it's a, long, a lifelong craft. For performance capture and for voice, you need to study theater, film, and television. Study all of it. Don't just go, I'm a voice actor, that's all I'll do. I actually don't like the term voice actor, funny enough. I think it's a little derogative in terms of it's misleading. Mm. Because I think people need to just get into the mindset of, you're an actor, you should be able to do everything. Whether you get to work in everything or not is immaterial. Because if you train in theatre, you'll understand how to take the stage with very little props around you, how to own your centre, how to be able to take command of the stage and use your imagination to fill in all the blanks. If you're a film actor, you understand about uh, camera positionings or possible movements of cameras, how to play the story intimately, because in performance capture and also in voice, everything is a close-up and a wide simultaneously. So I think theatre and film in the middle is performance capture and voice work in a way as well. Because you have that intimacy, you need to be able to build character. You have to be, have a useful body that you can connect to. Doesn't mean, by the way, body size doesn't matter in performance capture. It doesn't make a difference what you look like in terms of the size of you. So you're it's, telling me I have a chance. I'm telling you, you got a chance, kid. It just, it just have to have a useful body. 
So you need to be connected to the body. You need to understand characterization, how to create a character that has habits and all that kind of stuff. And that comes from theatre as well as film and TV. But if you only have one or the other, you're going to miss out on the opportunity that a role can present you. The other thing I would always say that people, when I, when I audition actors, I haven't auditioned you actually, um, when I audition actors, I want them to treat the audition as the job. I don't want them in there going, I really need this, or I really like it, I really want the job. I don't give a shit about that. What I want is people go, this is the job, here's my work, I'm gonna give you everything I've got, I don't care whether or not there's anything beyond that because this is the moment to live in. And if I see that, somebody coming in, not with arrogance, but with confidence of, I get to work right now, this is my job, let me show you my idea, then great, I'm excited, I'm into it. There are no little roles, in other words. No, in mocap there aren't, because I used, when I used to work with some of these guys, I was a supporting character, and I did five roles, and I was on every single day that you were, for instance. It's been so cool, honestly, just before we lose him, to watch, Neil's been doing this for seven gazillion years, so while he's got a huge line now, he did years and years and years of the most amazing work and characters and all of these things that never were appreciated in the same way as being a star in. So it's lovely to now have that level because, I mean, he's just done everything under the sun and that kind of work ethic is what keeps you alive because Thank this you. is not about fame at all. It is about craft work yeah. and I can point to so many zombies in RE3 that are all Neil Newman. Um, <laughs> just dying. I played zombie Brad. Yeah, you did. He played zombie Brad. Honestly, he guys, he, he's, he, his resume is the only one with chapters that I know of. <laughs> just saying, look, look him up. You'd yeah, be surprised. My show, my show reel is disgusting. It's like a legacy reel now. But I mean, but winding back to the actors in the room and anybody that's aspiring to be a voice actor, drop the voice bit. Just be an actor that does voice work. Study everything. And I, I've, I still study. I still go into the studio. So I've got a teacher, Giles Foreman. I studied, I studied method work, went to Laban work, yeah, Malgrim's work, oh, Meisner wow. work, community del arte, mask work, animal work, on and on and on, including doing martial arts and all other stuff as well. I don't believe in stopping the craft work. It's always, you're always learning. And if you can do that mentality of, here's my work, they think I'm good enough because they gave me the audition, the audition is the job, try and learn as much as you can, then you're in a good place. And then it's not, and also you're not in competition with anybody else, it's you showing your work to them. And if they like you and you like them, by the way, it's a double thing, yeah? If you want to work with them and they like, want to work with you, if that gels, you're going to have a great time. Because then when you turn up on set, you've got nothing to prove, you just got the work to do. And all that insecurity nonsense, people, when people act out with ego, mm. that just isn't there because you're just having fun. Because it's supposed to be fun. Yep. Mike. Bye, Neil. That Bye. Is awesome. Bye. 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 Neil Newborn, everyone. Thank you so much. All right. So we just want to take a quick time out here. I think what we're going to do is if everybody can uh, calmly and... Yeah. I didn't get to the good part yet. Oh, something else happened. Um, if everybody can make a... Uh, uh, start to form a line right behind my associate here, the smoke, uh, right at that microphone, what we're going to do is we're going to do a question and answer period. Think of some good questions. Keep them brief, please, to the point, and we're going to get through as many as we can in the remaining time that we have. So, oh, we look like we have somebody that's yeah. already ready. Yeah. Preferably please. yes or no questions. Yeah, or I'm multiple just choice. Kidding. You know, yeah, multiple please. choice. If I can answer it with a magic eight ball. Magic eight ball. And remember. Sorry, not this time. And remember, make sure your question is straight to the point, not a lingering question, not a 25 minute question, a question. Okay? If you don't, I'm going to correct you. Okay? First victim. I mean, first contestant. I mean, come on up. No pressure. All right. <laughs> first Resident Evil game. What? That we played? Yes. Resident Re Evil 2 original. Same. Nice. I gotta be honest, I played RE3 Remake first. There you go. <laughs> LOL. I played my own there. game. Yeah. Nice. Technically, I've the never played Resident a Resident Evil game, OG. so TBD. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> All right. All right. Great question. Awesome. That was great. Nick. Uh, also, Nicole, uh, you are almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> Jill sandwich. Oh no. It's all about falling out. Yeah. Right. I. I didn't pay attention to the schedule. So, quick question for you guys. You guys do the motion capture and it's awesome, but I don't think I've ever heard you guys talk about, like, do you guys also do the motion capture for the death sequences, which are like a big deal in Resident Evil games when 
the character gets killed, zombies impaled, like they can be some pretty gruesome deaths. Do you guys do the mocap for that as well? Uh, that's a good question. Um, most of the, you mean when someone's killing you, they, they a do death a animation, death animation. Yeah. Yeah, biting the neck, all that stuff. No, I don't think anyone here has done those, but uh, we have to do the, the facial capture for that. And so the, the body is kind of pre-animated because of the violence right, in the movements. Um, but we will record the face and the voice to match that. And then they stitch it all together to make it brutal. Yeah, so we technically, another thing too, which Neil was talking about, when people think like voice over, and they'll be like, oh yeah, but do you do any real acting? I freaking hate it when people say that crap. So like, um, it's because we really are. So even when you're just doing voice over, uh, we are physically moving our bodies contorting ourselves to create that. So although we don't have the motion capture for it in that essence, because I don't know where you end up getting us killed through, you know, we couldn't possibly get the physics right every time. Um, so yes, yeah, so we do get all the other physicality of it there. Right, because if you're getting choked, it could sound like this and go, eh, eh, or it could go, Wah! Nick knows this you know really what I mean? well. Like, that's, <laughs> the, <laughs> that's the difference. If you guys know the story that's here. that's why he was hired. <laughs> all right, thank you guys. <laughs> Good question. Come on up. So I want to ask, sorry, I want to ask, what is your favorite part about bringing these characters to life? Like at the voice acting or like the physical motion capture or even just seeing the finished result at the very end? I think the finished result at the very end is really fun for a lot of us because this process involves so many people. It literally takes a village is the cute joke. Um... The, the final product Dad is joke. still so different and so surprising for us. We get to experience what the players are experiencing for the first time in the first way. So a lot of people go like, well, don't you know what's going to happen? And it's like, yes, but we didn't get uh, the music, the graphics, the final art, the, you know, all of the other crazy things that come in to make these games genuinely scary. Um, so as far as like playing the final product, and especially for those of us that like to, to kind of stream our, our reactions, I know Steph and I and Nick have all kind of played um it's really really cool and it does surprise us and it does scare us because we don't know every zombie that's going to jump out we just did seven thousand ah, reacts to zombies jumping out and you don't know the select they choose too so like we may have done a scene you know however many times we don't know what was chosen always so we get to see what's chosen then you know, and then we can be like, oh, or I forgot about that. Or like Mr. X, we didn't have Mr. X in there. Like we got to experience Mr. X just like you guys did, you know, <laughs> which is really traumatically. But anyways, but like, you know, like that's what we did. <laughs> so. uh, my favorite part is uh, once in a while, Nicole invites me onto her stream and she's very, very gullible. And sometimes I can trick her into going into like a safe place. <laughs> And then something might come out and grab or kill her. And she, her reactions are brilliant. And uh, that's why uh, I'm no longer invited on her streams. Thank you so much. You can watch them on YouTube. So, so just to, before the next question, I have something just to ask. So because you know, Nicole brought up something, and it's about just how you're able to, like, you know, get into the character and how you're able to put a piece of yourself into it. To what degree do the directors get involved with honing you? Or is it, is it very strict, the direction you get? Or is it kind of you're allowed to kind of feel out scenes and feel out the, the voice work and the character work? What, what kind of creative leeway do you typically get? Really depends on the director. Every job is different. Everybody works differently. So that's also part of putting in your 10,000 hours in advance as an actor so that you are versatile and flexible enough to make those changes and to be able to do the work that you need to do regardless of what kind of direction you're getting or being able to pivot on a dime. If the director's like, actually, we're gonna take this in the complete opposite direction, then you're like, yes, and. Uh, so, full stop. And full as stop. much of a goober as Maggie is and we love, she's also one of the most professional, prepared, excellent, able to pivot kind of actors. That as I have ever clearly demonstrated today, my professionalism. But genuinely, is... we, we joke, and also there still is, you can feel it in, in Neil's severity as well, right? He has a lot of sincerity and a lot of passion, and that's echoed across the board here. Everyone here is very professional, and we show up, and of course we have fun, but first you come with your work and you know what your work is and and it's it's important to you and you make it important so okay awesome. good job max thank you and yeah, i think the other you. thing too is like um i personally love to ask a lot of questions which i uh, 
assuming probably like some of us are like, I won't like, I'm a little bit of a pain in the butt because I'm like, why am I saying that? I, why would she even say that? Like, I just don't get it. You know what I mean? And if I don't like it, I will ask or question it and then either will rework it or they'll let me kind of play with it. Or next thing you know, like on two, <laughs> sitting down with the writer and I was like, he's like, after a while, he's like, Stephanie, do you like this? Are you good with this? Do you want to change anything here? Do you feel like she would say this? Oh, like, this is awesome. You know, thank you for loving on me like this, you know? But, but that's, that's the beautiful part is when you have that collaborative space. But again, not every director is like that. And you have to be able to go, okay, it's my job to take direction. And I have to be able to take that direction. And sometimes we have an idea of what we think it's going to be. And then when we finally listen to what that other person's vision was, we're like, oh my gosh, I just discovered something else in my character I didn't even know was sitting in there, so. Because realistically, too, we have such a microscopic view of the big picture. So we really rely on the other creatives that are in that room with us to provide the macro view. And we trust them and we rely on them to help guide us to where our performances need to be within the context of the entire game because we have such a narrow, narrow field of vision. So that's part of why you have to be able to take direction and pivot. Mm. Absolutely. Full stop. Thank you. Awesome. Next. <laughs> yeah. You guys spend so much time as these characters, and I was wondering, do you ever find yourself having a personal attachment to them in a way that's beyond just, you know, playing them as your career? Because, you know, you spend so many hours with them. Yeah. Of course. I've been a, Leon has been one of my all-time favorite characters since 98, and so, you know, when I, when I got the role, I was very excited, very happy. Uh, but then the pressure Which I think is in. the coolest thing about Nick because you guys, he's such a nerd and he was yeah. such a Leon fan before he even booked Leon. And then for him to have this dream role come true is so yeah. exciting and so thrilling and go on. Stuff, thank you. Stuff like this doesn't come around often uh, for a guy like me. And so there was pressure. I knew the shoes that I had to fill. You know, I'm friends with uh, just about every actor who has portrayed Leon in the past, and they're they're brilliant uh, performers. So yeah, I understood the pressure. But now that I'm I'm playing him, yes, it's very special. I just want to do him justice because I liked him so much, and now it's become something different because now we get to sit here and connect with you guys, like all fellow fans and everything. So it's kind of taken on like a different life after the games come out. So it's a whole different thing, playing them and then, uh, then experiencing this together. What's happening? Is she making fun of me? It was an Aquaphor ad, me. and she was applying it, Thank and you. I was like, that's definitely on screen. And Nick, not to, not to put you on the spot here, but one of my other favorite horror franchises I mentioned before you came out here is Dead Space. Yeah, I understand Dead Space. You, you did some work with Dead Space as well. Do you remember which character that was offhand? Yeah, I'm going to make a small correction. So I didn't voice characters in Dead Space. Uh, what I worked on is the vertical slice. If anybody doesn't know that, it's uh, in early development. They throw some ideas on the table uh, to see what a game is going to be like and feel like. And I got to portray um, Isaac Clarke for a few select scenes. Nice early on in development and then some of those scenes actually made its way into the game. So I've actually did some mocap for the lead character and yes, I've, wow. been, I've been playing Dead Space since it came out in I think 07? 08 or something yeah. like that? Yeah, 08. Really, if you guys like horror and haven't played Dead Space, it's like Resident Evil Resident in space. Resident Evil in space, exactly. Yeah, that's that awesome. I geek out over that game too. That's one of my top five, so I had to ask. It's great. Very yeah. cool. Awesome. Hi. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm... Hi, Sarah. Hi! <laughs> I'm a little nervous. I just um, got her more nervous, I'm sorry. <laughs> no. um, I just wanted to know, is there like a specific line or a moment in the games that you feel personally attached to or is one of your favorites? Bitch can't even swim. Yeah. <laughs> you want stars? I'll give you stars. <laughs> wow, Nicole. You're so good. Thanks. I'm an actor. You should cast me. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll slice you to ribbons. Is that it? I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll slice, slice you to ribbons. Huh? Yeah. Uh, you where's everybody going? Thing. Bingo? <laughs> Come on up, Ken. All right. Oh, hold on. No, wait. The party's still going. Hold on. We're, <laughs> we're brainstorming. Yeah. Say, what are your favorites? What's your favorite? What's your favorite, Claire? Stupid man. You stupid man thing. Even better. 
Nice. Yes. No notes. Yeah. Next. Awesome. So, um, I was wondering what game outside of the Resident Evil franchise that you've played has like scared the absolute crap out of you. Alien Isolation, and I never finished. Excellent. Um, Son of a gun, this freaking game, I was playing it, and I got stuck on the part where the alien is murdering me, so I never even got to finish, and I was streaming it live, and it is forever a channel joke now on my channel, but anyways, I freaking hate it, but I also kind of wish I had finished it. Done. I'm such a little baby, so whenever they make me play horror games, so outside of Resident Evil, which I've played most of them at this point, many of them at least, um, I've played Little Nightmares, and I think it's really scary. It's I cute scary. It's really scary. Yeah. Uh, for me, that's easy. The original Silent Hill. Yeah. That, to this day, that was the only game that I've played, uh, I don't know, I was 14 or something like that, um, I, w I would play at night at like midnight, one o'clock, when everyone was asleep. I was downstairs in the dark. That's the experience I wanted. And that was the only game where I would get to a part where I had to open this door and I did not want to see what was on the other side of it. And I would just, I would just shut off the console and, and run upstairs because it was dark. And uh, that was the only game that did that to me. So I got to give love Silent Hill. If, if, if I may, I'm, go I'm gonna answer the gentleman's question too. I know he wasn't really asking me, but you did bring up Silent Hill, so I'm just gonna, you know, Silent Hill scares me and Resident Evil scares me. Outlast terrifies me. That is pound for pound, I think, the scariest game I've ever played. You, Outlast, anyone, if you played? Uh, I did the trials. Yeah, Outlast that's, trials. oh man, yeah, yeah. It's very, very scary, awesome. Go ahead, next question. Next. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, everyone, for uh, being here today. Uh, I just have a casual question. What's the best or most, most complicated food or meal you know how to make or prepare? Ooh. <laughs> I'm not a cook, so. <laughs> Grilled cheese and tomato soup. All right. Uh, let's say uh, two Greek dishes. Any Greek people in here? Nick is actually That's a, a really good cook. Amazing yeah, so there's cook, a long though. list of It's um, really different. unfair. There's, there's two dishes, spanakopita, which some of you might know as spinach pie. I don't know. Anyways, that one's complicated, but there's even a more complicated one called pastizio. It's a Greek, Greek lasagna. Nick, can, can I ask a question before we move on? Can we get a ruling on this? And I, I mean this in all sincerity. Is it gyro, gyro, hero? How, how is it? I'm gyro? from the Philadelphia area, so Where I hear gyro everything. in there? Is it? I'm just gonna say Giro. I said Giro. Okay, uh, you got it. Sorry, nice. real quick. I still have to answer my food one. Damn it. Um, so I, I come from. My father is an executive pastry chef. So um, nice. for those of you guys, I don't know if many of you Pastry's actually have been able so to eat my food yet. Actually, now that I think about it. Uh, but two of the most complicated dishes. Whose fault is that, Stephanie? Yeah, actually. <laughs> I don't know. We're all really busy. Where's our invite? <laughs> Over so for true. dinner. <laughs> Sorry. Um, anyways, so uh, I made a uh, dark chocolate mousse cake with raspberries and a dark chocolate ganache. That is complicated to do uh, with a nice glaze over it. Getting that shimmer is a big deal. And then I would say uh, a paella is always, there's a lot awesome. of steps to get that rice correct and get every single thing in there, so done. I love eating food, I don't love making food, but recently I've been trying really hard to make an excellent French omelet and I've yet to really achieve it. They still come out a little but I've really, like, I've really sat there with the slow egg moment. It's just really, anyway, I put a lot of effort in and that's, I thought we time. were going to get a Jill sandwich joke. Oh, that would have been a great opportunity. I, we we set you up. Jeez, wow, failure. The most complicated thing I can make is a Jill sandwich. <laughs> okay, we got three more questions. All right. All right, go ahead. Hi, uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the classic Marvel versus Capcom games, but, like, because Resident Evil is, te is technically part of Capcom, I got to ask, if you had the opportunity to, who would you... Who would your respective characters interact or fight against, whether it's like a Marvel or like a, a Capcom character, like a Street Fighter character, for example? I would like to take on Guile. Uh. <laughs> oh no, it's
it's me. Um, I, did, so Lady D, did, okay, she, would she fight anybody or would she have to fight the heroes? I think her and Hella, I don't know if Hella's in there, but they, she should be, and I think they would be bosom buds and they could just kill everybody together. So she wouldn't be fighting her, but they'd team up for sure. Yes. Uh, yes. Claire, I don't know. I feel like she would just like to like, it would be like more just for saying that she's able to kick someone's ass, so probably Ken. I feel like she'd just be like, hey, Ken, yeah, nice ripped up shirts. Let's see if you can like back it up, you know, kind of thing. They're both in red. I feel like Jill would take on I mean. someone that she, there's just no way in any reality she could actually win against. Um, so someone with all of the magic, probably one of the Marvel characters. That or I'd love to see... The Hulk. Yeah, right? Just like Jill v. Hulk. Um, I'll, also, I love Chun-Li. So like some Chun-Li okay. moments. Right. Nice. That could be fun. Nice. Hey, guys. Hello. Hi. Um, I was wondering what was one of the most memorable notes that was given to you by the directors or the other creatives behind the scenes in the Resident Evil franchise? Gasp, but this is vulnerable. <laughs> um, I'm going to say from our director, uh, Steve Knibli, which uh, many of us have worked with, uh, I'd say the best note that Hi. I got from him was, yeah, that was pretty good. <laughs> we agree? So yep, Steve, that's about all you'll get. <laughs> Steve's gotten nicer and nicer through the years, and I worked with him really early on, and I, you would know it was time to move on. The way that he would tell you a scene was good, and this, this was the note that I would get a lot, and I just had to kind of put a gauge and be like, all right? He'd be like, that'll work. Let's move on. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, great. I'm so glad. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Mr. X. So, a lot of the lines in some of the older, in the original Resident Evil games, one through four, obviously not all of them are going to be featured in the remakes or have been featured. What's the one line that you guys wanted to, either wanted to say or, ha or wish would, you could have said nice. in any of the remakes? A line from the original that we didn't get to say? A line from one of the original games you wish you could say as your new character if there was a remake, right? Uh, well, for RE4, there's a lot of them, and a lot of people missed some of the classics. But for me, as a diehard fan of the original, uh, I would say if I got to say, uh, your right hand comes off. <laughs> nice. I thought That's that would have been one. fun. Nice. I mean, I, I said, like, a version of it, but it would have been really cheesy, but I was okay with this line. But don't shoot! I'm a human! <laughs> oh, I almost forgot about that. This one's not a funny one, but I just love it, and it was September 28th, daylight. Monsters have overtaken the city. Somehow, I'm still alive. <laughs> That's a good one, too. Nice. That's wow. awesome. Are you an actor? You should think about it. On Tuesdays. That was really good. <laughs> Guys, this has been a lot of fun. Everybody have fun. These were great, great questions from the audience. Great responses. Thank you all so much for your time. This really meant a lot. We're all big fans. These are your people. One more time, give it up for Stephanie Penicillo. Penicillo, Panicello, however you want to say. <laughs> Penicillo. Maggie Robertson. Nicole Tompkins and Nick Apostolidis. My name is Civic Minded. We are Pass the Controller. This is Too Many Games. You guys have been a great crowd. Take care. Thank you, everybody. You rock.